And good morning, New Life Church, man. We are so excited to be with you once again during this Corona uh, virus uh, challenge and time in our history. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And yet, God has prepared us for such a time as this. Did you know, I mean, I shared last uh, in the, in the pre-gathering connection that we had, did you know we had over 1,600 views for our Easter gathering? God is doing some wonderful things. I'm so happy about that. Let me just say happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, New Life Church. Today is our nine-year anniversary. Yes, it's been nine years since we have launched a New Life Church when we started it at Joseph Widmer Elementary School in the gymnasium uh, on, that, on that Easter uh, Sunday morning nine years ago. And we're so excited about what God is doing. And today we are officially announcing that it is 20 weeks, 20 weeks from this week uh, when we are launching our River Islands campus, which will be the fifth campus that we are launching as a church. We're excited about it. Yes, River Islands, if you're listening, we are coming. Uh, we're coming. We're coming. We're so excited. We have secured a facility. We'll be launching on Monday night church, a Monday evening church at the Boathouse at River Islands in 20 weeks. We can't wait to, to connect with you and share with you and love you and, and make that an awesome opportunity. Monday night church. Some of you might say, why are you doing a Monday evening church? Because River Islands is a large community planned community uh, that is primarily commuter culture and when people are commuting here they're commuting here it's uh, hours and hours of commute and so we want to uh, give you an opportunity to go to church with your family on a Monday evening so you can have your your special protected weekend time with your family and so we aren't we don't believe there's anything necessarily sacred about Sundays there's something sacred about gathering together and so we're excited about joining with you on Monday evenings in 20 weeks we're going to be there at the boat house at River Islands. It's going to be an exciting opportunity for us to connect and spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to get into a new series today, and the new series is entitled, The Second After You Die. What happens the second after you die? Well, first of all, how many of you would say, I don't really like talking about death very much. I don't really like thinking about death very much. My wife would probably fall into that category when I try to have a conversation with her about, you know, if I happen to die first, it, it's very quickly, uh, it comes to a close or it triggers her. It's, it's, nobody likes talking about death. I try to be prepared for it. I have a box of documents and everything's all organized for my wife, labeled Keeley's name on it. So if something was to happen to me, she'll be able to just know exactly what to do. But we don't like talking about things like dying, do we? You, you might say, why are we talking about death, Troy? It's not a very fun subject, especially right now. Right now when people can just turn off their phone or turn off their, their computer or turn off YouTube and they can disengage because when you're at church and you've got them at least trapped in the room and they're sitting in the building and where are they going to go? And you can, but now you're taking a risk and I, I understand. But I also know that the Lord has spoken to me and said that now is the time to talk about the second after you die. Why are we talking about what happens the second after you die? Well, the reason is because what you believe about eternity will determine how you live today. What you believe about eternity will determine how you live today today. If you believe that you are an accident, if you believe that there is no God, that there is no eternity, then you're going to live a selfish life, a life driven for the pleasures of this time, and everything is going to be about now. Everything is going to be about, about you. If in turn you believe that you were created by a God for his glory and that you will live somewhere eternally, it will shape the way that you live. What we believe about eternity will determine how we live today. You see, the truth is, you don't really die. Now, your body, your body will cease to exist, but you will never cease to exist. You will live eternally somewhere. And so, next week in this three-part series, next week I'm going to talk in this series called The Second After You Die, I'm gonna talk about the horror of hell. Now that is the last message that I'd ever want to teach, that I'd ever want to preach as a pastor for the last 25 years. It's the last message that I want to share. I just, I'd rather talk about Jesus, I'd rather talk about his goodness, I'd rather talk about the blessings and favor of God, but the Lord has specifically instructed me to talk to you next week about the horror 
of hell. Is hell a real place? Yes, it is. What happens in hell? Who goes to hell? Why did God create hell? Do you just play cards with a bunch of fraternity brothers in hell for the rest of forever? And does real suffering happen in hell? How long? How long does hell last? Guys, we're gonna talk about that next, next Sunday, and I hope you'll be with me. And then the last Sunday of this series, in two weeks, we're gonna talk about, uh, in this series called The Second After You Die, we're gonna talk about the glory of heaven. Now, I can't wait to talk about this one. Who goes to heaven? What do you do when you're in heaven? Is it just gonna be this long, droning worship service? Are we gonna sing for like a thousand years? In is that really what it's all about? Well, do you, do you get a new body when you're in heaven? Do you recognize people in heaven? Uh, what do you do in heaven? We're gonna talk about all those things in a couple of weeks in this series, a second after you die. I'm telling you, this is gonna be a good good teaching for you and for me to grow in our relationship with God. But the truth is, I didn't wanna do this and I didn't plan on this series. Um, I planned another series. I'd planned up until Thursday of this week, I'd planned on teaching a three-part series leading up to Mother's Day called Don't Give Up. Man, how many of you would like to hear a series called Don't Give Up right now? I mean, it sounds very appropriate, it sounds very logical, it sounds reasonable that at such a time as this, with what's going on in our culture, that we would be teaching on Don't, don't Give Up. We'll, we'll get to that one later, but the Lord has instructed me, and I, I gotta follow his instructions, and God has said, but you'll put that one on the back burner for now because you're gonna talk about the second after you die. And so today I wanna lay a foundation for this, this series, and I wanna talk about three things that happen when this life is done. Three things that happen when this life is done. Here we go, guys. If you're taking notes, write down number one. The first thing that happens when this life is done is our physical body dies. When this life is done, our physical body dies. I'm gonna be looking at all kinds of scriptures today in the word. They'll be on your screen, so take a look at those as they're there, but, but I want you to jot, jot them down and look them up and try to stay up with me, but here we go. Hebrews chapter nine, verse number 27. Just as a man is destined to die once, People are destined to what? To die once, and after that to face judgment. People are destined to die once. Now listen, maybe uh, you, you didn't read or hear the recent study, but studies are conclusive. One out of one people die. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no arguing it. Everybody dies. You're, you're gonna die, you're, you're gonna die. You're gonna die somehow, and some day, I don't know how. I was thinking about, I had extra time this week, as all of you probably have had some extra time this week to think about this a little bit. I was thinking, what would be the worst way to die? And immediately I thought, shark attack. You know, shark attack. That'd be like the worst way to die. I wouldn't want to die as being attacked by a shark. And so since we were quarantined this week, I did a little research and the internet never lies. And so I, I Googled on the internet to try to find out about shark deaths. And I discovered some things that was really comforting to me as I was reading this. Did you know that you are more likely likely to die from the following things than you are a shark attack. You're more likely to die by getting hit in the head by a champagne cork than you are being killed by a shark. That's comforting to me. I don't know about you because I, that's comforting. That you are more likely to die by getting on the hitting by getting hit on the head by a falling coconut than you are by a shark attack. I know that happens apparently. You are more likely to die as a result of bad handwriting then you are a shark attack. You know, your doctor is writing a prescription and writes sloppy and gets it turned in and the dosage is wrong and you die from that, I don't know, but you're more likely to die from that than a, than a, than a shark attack. You're more likely to die by falling off the toilet than you are from a shark attack. And can I just be real personal for just a second? Some of you needed to heed that correction and quit leaning to the right right now as you're watching this mess. I'm just gonna throw that out there. I don't know, maybe you're not there. Or what. Anyway, I can't see you, so no worries. You're more likely to die by getting your head stuck in a vending machine trying to get your bag of Doritos out than you are from a shark attack. I know, isn't that crazy? I mean, it was on the internet, so it's gotta be true. Uh, my point is this, you're gonna die. And I'm gonna die 
We all have that one thing in common. We don't want to talk about it. We don't really want to face it. The brevity of life is very, very, very real. And at such a time as this, when so many people are perishing around us, I think we should pay attention. One day, we're all going to die. We don't know how, and we really don't know when, thank God. But you came from dust, and your body will go back to dust. You are nothing but dust. Now, turn to your neighbor and say, turn to your family member and say, your spouse and say, you are nothing but dust. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't just say you are but dust. I didn't say that. I said you are nothing but dust. So, <laughs> I know, I, I know. So, what's going to happen when this life is done? When this life is done, number one, your physical body will die. It kind of seems oversimplistic, but I need to make sure that that's at the forefront. And yet so many people live as though their body, their physical body is never going to die. And I believe it changes everything when you live now, when you give some attention to the reality that at some point you're going to die. Number two, our spirit will separate from our physical body. Our spirit separates from our physical body. Your physical body dies is number one, and then your spirit will separate from your physical body. Our bodies are going to stay behind, but our spirit will continue to live. Jesus said this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse number 28. He said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, don't fear people, revere God. I want you to know the word soul that can kill soul and body. That word soul, um, as I continue to teach and study about this, that word soul that's equivalent to it means soul and spirit, just in case you were wondering. The spirit is what goes to heaven. It's the trichotomy of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. And if you're following along in the Bible study that I'm doing on Wednesdays in this, uh, we're studying a book that I wrote, which is totally based upon scripture called, called Brain Power. And if you've been following along, I, I encourage you to study this study with us. It's very timely. It will help you loving God with all of your mind. But this 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23, along with many other scriptures in the Bible, teach us that we are a spirit living in a body, possessing a soul. And when my body ceases to exist, my spirit continues to live. My spirit is going to live somewhere. In other words, at my funeral one day, at the funeral of Troy Allen Stein, at my funeral one day, the, the preacher is going to declare these words at the final portion of the graveside service. He or she is going to declare, we commit the spirit of Troy to God, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. And then that person will likely pray, and everybody will go back to my house and have sandwiches. That's what will happen, because that's what we do. But I will be more alive than ever at that point. Why? Because my spirit is alive even though my body ceases to exist, and so will yours. During our last series, the series that I called I Am, we saw Jesus illustrate a truth for us in John's gospel when he was talking to his dear friend Martha. His dear friend Martha's brother, Lazarus, who was also a friend of Jesus, had died. And Jesus wasn't there. And Lazarus had now been dead and buried in the tomb for four days. And this is what Jesus said to Martha in John's gospel, chapter 11, beginning at verse number 25. He said, he said, um, who are you? Uh, excuse me, John's ch ch chapter 11. I got to turn a page over. Beginning of verse number 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, I'm just going to answer the question, yes, I absolutely believe that, and I hope you do as well. What happens to the spirit 
of a believer, of someone who has a relationship with Jesus Christ, somebody who follows Jesus after their body dies. What happens to their spirit? Well, let me just answer that question with an illustration that comes directly from Jesus, from the life of Jesus. Jesus illustrated this when he was hanging on the cross, uh, as he was getting ready to give his life as a ransom for yours and a ransom for mine, there was a thief hanging on his left and a thief hanging on his right. Both of those criminals were guilty. Both of those criminals needed forgiveness. One recognized his need for forgiveness and called upon the grace of Jesus Christ and the other one didn't. And we find this in Luke chapter 23, uh, beginning at verse number 39. Luke 23, beginning at verse number 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at, at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. That man's spirit, when he died, went to paradise. What exactly is that? Well, the New Testament paradise is simply another word for heaven, the dwelling place of God. I don't know about you, but I want to go there one day. I want my spirit to reside in the dwelling place of God, and I want so desperately for your spirit to reside in the dwelling place of God as well. Paul, the apostle Paul, wrestles with this. What do I want is his question. What, what do I want in this life? Do I want to continue to live here and make a difference? Or do I want to go, uh, want my spirit to go? Do I want to go ahead and die and go to where I really want to be, a place that is better for me? This is what he said in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. In other words, what Paul is saying is, I, I really, I don't know which one is better. I, I really want to go and be with Jesus. I really want to die and go and be with Jesus because Paul knew that his spirit, upon the time that his body was to die and begin the decaying process, that his spirit was going to be with Jesus the second after he dies. But for your sakes, Paul says, I'm going to stay here. Listen, listen, let me just kind of throw this out there as a bonus material today. So many people want to live because they don't want to die. I challenge you, want to live because it would be better for the people around you because you can influence them and make decisions that can help people and benefit the world around you. Want to live so that you can live for others. Don't want to live so you can live for yourself. Because for me, to die is gain to be with Jesus in heaven for the rest of eternity. Man, that is the benefit. That is the best. That is my hope and glory, and that's yours too. But want to live like Paul so you can help people, so you can serve people, so you can make a difference in this world for the kingdom of God. What happens the second after we die? The second after we die, our physical bodies die. They begin to decay. Second after we die, our spirit continues to live and it separates from our body. And at some point, number three, here we go, we will face, we will all face judgment. We will all face judgment. Peter said it this way in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 17. Since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent 
fear. Now, I'd like to show you that in the message version as well. And uh, I'd like to read that one to you. You call out to God for help, and he helps. He is a good father that way. But don't forget, he is also a responsible father and won't let you get by with sloppy living. That comes straight from God's, God's word. He is a good father, and he will judge us according to what we do with what we've got. You, you got to live in reverent fear of God during your time as temporary residents on planet earth. Remember, this world is not your home. You've heard it many times before. You are just passing through. This life is short. It's here for just a second in the, in the eternal scheme of things and of time. James chapter 4, verse number 14 tells us why, why you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What, what is your life? Are you a mist that appears for a little while and then is gone? It vanishes? A puff of smoke here today and it's gone tomorrow? Listen, that's what life is all about. And at the end of this life, we will either be judged harshly or we will be rewarded generously. And there's nothing you can do about that. There's nothing you can change about that. You need to know the truth today, ladies and gentlemen. Let me show you in scripture. There's actually two judgments that will take place. And there are only two judgments that will take place. There is not a third option. You cannot coerce or manipulate or talk your way in or out of either one of these. This is God's word, and God's word is truth. And it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you want. This is what God's word says. And so heed his word and know these are the judgments. The first judgment is called the great white throne judgment. Most scholars believe, and I absolutely agree, that the great white throne judgment is for non-believers only, for people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, for people who don't um, have a Jesus residing and living in their hearts. This is what scripture says in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11, with regard to the great white throne judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What, what's that, Troy? What's the, what's the lake of fire? Well, we're going to talk about what that is more next week when we connect together. I, I hope, hope you're listening because what is the book of life? This is where we have hope and we have promise and we have joy and we have assurance and we have confidence. And this is amazing news. What we know is that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God. He was born without sin, and he was called the Lamb of God who was slain for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus died in our place. Hallelujah. We deserve a devil's hell. We deserve the punishment that he took, but he bore all that punishment, innocent though he was, while we were totally guilty. Jesus gave it all for us. And when you come to a place like the criminal hanging on the side of Jesus on the cross, when you recognize you have a need, and when you call out upon the grace of Jesus Christ, you are saved. You're saved not by your works, but you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And when you call out to him and confess that he alone is Lord and you confess your sins to him, and you repent of your sins, which means you turn away from them, not by your own effort, by your own tenacity, but by his power and his strength inside of you, then your name is written in the book of 
life. I have over here for you an example of that. This is a, a, an example of the great white throne judgment. And when you stand before God on that day at the great white throne judgment, the angel will look through the book to see if your name is, let me just let, me just let you know something right now. If you're standing at this judgment one day and you're waiting in line, you know your name is not written in that book. Everybody who stands in line at this judgment will not be found in that book. It is a judgment that is intended for people who don't know God. It is a dreadful, terrible judgment for someone to have to go through. And each time a person approaches, the the angel will look and discover your name is not written in that book. It's a terrible, horrible, horrifying thing to even consider or to think about. Um, And one thing that I do know is if your name is written in the book of life, also known as the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says your name can never be blotted out from that book. Did you know in heaven there is no such thing as white out? There is no eraser in heaven. You can't be taken away. Your name is in his book, and when your name is in his book, you are a child of God, and he's gonna receive you into heaven. And when the angel looks, and your name is not written in that book, a terrible thing will happen. You'll hear the words from the Lord. Jesus will say the words that he told us about in Matthew chapter 7 in what I would say are some of the most sobering and horrifying words in all of the entire Bible. In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Why does he say that? Why does Jesus say that? Because he's talking to people who did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that did not repent of their sins and give their lives completely over to the lordship of Christ. Now I realize, for those of you that have been in church for a while, the words that I just said make total sense. And I also realize for those of you that haven't been in church, you're like, you're talking a language, you're using all this Christianese wordage, verbiage, I don't understand it. I'm gonna make it crystal clear for you in just a minute. How can you be sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Because just to make sure you understand, if your name is not written in that book in heaven, on that reservation list, You haven't reserved a spot in advance in heaven. If it's not written in that book, there is nothing you can do at that point to change the mind of our great and mighty God. You made your choice on earth, and you will spend forever separated from God in darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is not God's will that any should perish, John 3, 16, but that all should come to repentance, that all should come to know Jesus Christ. His will, his will is that your name would be in this book. The one who has all the power, all the control, is you. It's not your mama. You can't blame it on somebody did did me wrong, or some preacher ticked me off one time, or they made fun of me when I was in Sunday school as a nine-year-old, and therefore I'm never... It's all on you. Each one of us is personally responsible for our own spiritual condition. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? How how, how can I know, Troy? How can I know if my name is written in the book? I'm gonna get to that, so don't you go anywhere. We're gonna get to that in just, just a minute. But I said there are two judgments. There is the great white throne judgment. Is your name written in the book? 
But there's a second judgment, and the second judgment is called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Paul was talking to believers in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10. And when he said these words, For we must all, talking to Christians, to believers, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, that means while we are alive, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is the, this is the second judgment. There's the great white throne judgment, and there's the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is also known as the in the Greek, it's a Greek word, bema, B-E-M-A, the bema seat. This is a, a reference to uh, the Olympics, the Greek Olympics. Um, God would oftentimes use through his followers, through the people who pinned, through, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, would use current things that would help them understand what he was talking about. How many of you appreciate that? You know, illustrate that for me. Help me understand that in real time. That's what was taking place here. The judgment seat of Christ. An illustration for that is the Greek Olympics. And what was the bema? Well, after, let's say, um, uh, runners would run a race, uh, the winners would come and they would stand, or uh, they would stand before the judge, the judge who would be seated. Uh, the winners would be standing before him. And the judge would give out awards at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know, let's say like in our current culture, the, uh, they would get a medal maybe placed around, around their neck, right? Or in their case, um, they, uh, they might get a crown that was placed upon their head. Or, or in that culture, a wreath would be laid upon them, maybe upon their head. Um, this would be a time that they would be rewarded uh, this would be a time, this wasn't a time that they were judged based upon, this was, this was not a time that they were judged based upon um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the did, you, um, did you follow or not? Were you, did you compete in the race or not? Did you qualify? This instead was a, a place where it says we celebrate the fact that you finished the race. This is a judgment where they say you were faithful. And because you were faithful, you're now going to be rewarded for what you have done. This is a judgment for Christians. This is a judgment that you want to go to. This is not the great white throne judgment that you don't want to go to. If your name is recorded in the book, then you're not going to have to appear at this judgment because you're already on the reservation list. And nobody has to prove to you that your name is not in there. By the way, this is the time that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But at this judgment, you've already done that. You've already bowed before the Lord. You've already confessed he is Lord and Savior of your life. I mean, he, Jesus already paid the penalty for the sins that you committed or ever will commit. And that's the good thing. But now, at this judgment, you're going to be judged based upon how you lived your life and what you did with what God gave to you. I need you to understand this. The judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment for your sins. Uh, this judgment uh, is for those who follow Jesus because your sins have already been forgiven by Jesus. This is a place where what you did on earth is rewarded in heaven. Now, some of you who have been with me for a while on this journey, this Christian journey here at New Life Church and other places where I've ministered over the years, might, might say, I'm confused, Troy, because for years you've said that we're not saved by our works. That is a correct statement. We are not saved. We're never saved by our works. You can't be religious enough to fall in good favor with God. You can't try hard enough. You can't get rid of enough bad stuff to be in right relationship with God. The problem is, by nature, we are all sinners. And our sin separates us from a holy God. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and only by the grace of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? We are saved by grace, but we are rewarded for works. 
I'm going to say it again. We are saved by grace, but we are rewarded for works. You see, when you've truly been transformed by Jesus, when you're no longer what you used to be, and you become a new creation. You recognize, God, I didn't ever bring anything significant to the table. (laughs) I have nothing to offer. You have everything to offer, God. When you know what's changed you is nothing that you have done, but it's everything that he has done. It's only because of Jesus Christ and his love, then suddenly you know I don't have to work for my salvation. I, don't, I could not work for my salvation, but instead I want to live for the glory of Jesus. Because of what he did for you, you are no longer the same. Hallelujah. You are saved by grace, but you are rewarded in heaven for how you live. For your works, what you do right now matters eternally. So I have a question for you. What will you be rewarded for or judged by when you stand before the Lord as a Christ follower? Because just because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life doesn't mean that you have no responsibility Now you have incredible responsibility and the responsibility he's given to you, the mantle he's placed upon you, the anointing that he's given to you, you will be held accountable for in your life. So at this judgment for Christ's followers, the judgment seat of Christ, the question is, how will you be judged? How will you be rewarded? You're like, well, what does that mean? What am I, what are you talking about, Troy? What am I gonna be judged for, rewarded for? You're gonna be judged for, or rewarded for how you treated people. How you treated people. You're gonna be judged for how you cared for the least of these, or how you cared for the outcasts, or how you cared for the poor, or the broken, or the marginalized, or the hurting. You'll be rewarded for or judged by your motives. God knows your motives. You'll be rewarded or judged by the words that you spoke. How many of you know that's a sobering thought? the language that I used and the words that I spoke, you'll be rewarded for or judged by how you endure suffering. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will suffer. We all suffer in this life. The question is, do you endure suffering well? We want so desperately for you to be healed and delivered. But God has a greater plan. It isn't just always that you would be healed or delivered, but do you endure your suffering well? Do you carry the cross daily and follow him? You'll be rewarded for that in eternity. You will be rewarded for or judged by what you do with what you have. Did you use your resources to be a blessing or did you hoard it all for yourself? You were gonna be rewarded for or judged by how, how many people you brought to know Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us clearly that there is a crown that will be given to people who win souls when you, when you go to the judgment seat of Christ. If you win souls, if you introduce people to Jesus on that glorious day, that judgment seat of Christ, he is gonna put upon your head a crown if you've won people to know him, if you influence people for him. Man, I can't wait for that day. I want my life to be a life that is used for him, by him, and for his glory and not for mine. And all of these rewards or judgments are given at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I realize I may have lost some of you, so I want to recap it right here for just a moment. The first thing that happens a second after you die is our body, our physical body, dies. Your physical body is going to die from earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. From the dust you came, from the dust you will return. Your physical body is going to die. And then secondly, your spirit is gonna separate from your body. I don't know what that looks like or how that takes place, but I know it takes place in a nanosecond's time because to be absent from the body, hallelujah, is to be present with the Lord for those of us who know Jesus Christ. So our spirit's gonna separate from our body and at some point, number three, we will all face 
judgment. Either we will face the great white throne judgment. That's the judgment that you don't want to be at. That's the judgment where the angel will open the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, the book of Jesus, that he paid the price for our sins, that you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, and you will, if your name is not recorded in that book, you will hear the words from the judge, Jesus Christ, depart from me, because I never knew you. That doesn't mean he didn't want to know you. It means you made a decision, or you didn't make a decision to know him. Or there'll be a second judgment. That second judgment is the judgment seat of Christ. And at the judgment seat of Christ, that's for believers, Christians who know Jesus. I did not say perfect people because there's no such thing. I did not say people who got it all together. This is a bunch of crackpots who did the best they could knowing that Jesus Christ was with them and would never leave them and never forsake them. That's the category that I fall into. We mess up every single day, but because of his blood, we are forgiven. Because we continue to live a repentant lifestyle, because we continue to trust him in all our ways. That, leaning upon him, that's what this judgment is for. And at this judgment, you're gonna be rewarded or judged by what you did with what you have. The time, the most valuable commodity, precious commodity there is. How did you use your time? Did you sit around binge watching and eating your bonbons? Or did you use this time that was off to study to show yourself approved? Did you use this time to pray for people who need to be prayed for? To send words of encouragement to people that need to be encouraged? What did you use this time for? And you're going to be rewarded for that. Or you're going to be judged for that. Can I just tell you, what are we going to do with these rewards? What are we going to do with these, these, I don't know what he's going to play. I don't know if he's going to give a trophy. I know it's not a participant's trophy, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, I don't know if he's going to, when he places the, the award around my neck or when he puts the crown upon my head or when he, when he gives me the wreath. I don't know. I, what are we going to do? With, I'll tell you what we're going to do with these things. The Bible tells me that I then will have the opportunity to bring before my God, my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, the offering, and the offering that I can present to him is the crown, the rewards that he gave to me for living a life well lived for him. And David said in the Old Testament, I will not give to the Lord an offering that costs me nothing. I will give to the Lord an offering that costs me everything. And I've committed my life to Jesus, to serving him, to propagating this good gospel message. And I will give to the Lord an offering that costs me something. One day, I will bow before God at the judgment seat of Christ, and I will lay before his feet. I will present him with all of the awards, with all of the crowns, with all, all of the uh, awards, and all will be given to him. See, I'm not doing it so I can walk around with cool badges in heaven and say, dude, aren't you that special person? I'm doing it so I can present to God an offering. And you don't go to heaven with anything. Everything you have will be left behind. It all burns up. It all will, will waste away. The only thing you can take to heaven with you is what you did with your life here on earth. How many people did you influence for Jesus? It's not a notch in your belt. It's a crown. In, it's a jewel in your crown. And you can present that as an offering back to him. So our body will die, our spirit separates from our body. We will all be judged, either at the great white throne judgment or at the judgment seat of Christ. So let me put it to you in closing in two possibilities. Two possibilities. First, I want to talk to you if you don't know Jesus, if you're unsaved. At New Life Church, we like to call folks that don't know Jesus the sought because Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. He's seeking after you today. Imagine your life is over. Imagine one, it's all, it's going to happen one day. Your life is over. You take your last breath and in, in a, just a second's time your physical body is dead. Game over. All the stuff that you've accumulated, it's left behind and your spirit separates from your body and you stand before Jesus and, and, and you, you you, you, you can't even stand before Jesus. You, you, you fall on your knees before him. Because if you didn't fall on your knees before him on earth, remember, you will fall on your knees before him in eternity. Because it says that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
even if you blasphemed, disobeyed, deliberately did not follow him on earth, you will bow before him. And in that time, that judgment, as, as uh, your name is being looked up in the Lamb's book of life at the great white throne judgment, you realize what's going on. You see the people in front of you. And, and they're each one, every one is being denied. Depart from me, I did not know you. Depart from me, I did not know you. Depart from me, I did not know you. And you beg and you plead for forgiveness, but it is too late. The angel, the angel looks up your name and, 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 and checks and, and double checks and looks at you and checks and double checks and your name is not written in the book. And you hear the words from Jesus where he said, you're like, but wait a minute, Jesus, before you say those words. I, I, I did. I, I prayed. I prayed. I mean, every now and then I prayed before my meals. I did. I prayed. Jesus, wait a minute. I gave some money. That, that bell ringer at the Salvation Army at Christmas. I gave, I gave some money. I tried to help people. I was nice to people most, most of the time. I was better than a lot of those religious hypocrites. I, I tried really, really hard. I did good works. I mean, I really did. I, I never killed anybody. I, 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 Jesus, help me. And Jesus is going to look at you and say, depart from me. I never knew you. The harshest words to hear from a loving father, but he will never break his promise. He will never lie to you. He gave you every opportunity while you were alive to pay attention, to listen, to give your life to Him. And so what's, what's, what's that going to be like on the other side of the words, depart from me, I never knew you. That's called the horror of hell. And as much as I don't want to, we're going to talk about that next week, what that means. Let's flip the script now. Same illustration, but this time you're saved. You know Jesus Christ. You weren't perfect. None of us are. But you lived a forgiven life. You really did. You know it's not about your works. It's about your faith in Jesus. And it's hard for us as Americans to understand because we, we earn what we get. It's not earning with Jesus. It's, it's yielding with Jesus. It's giving our lives over to Him. And so your life is over. You die as a Christian. Your physical body is going to die, game over, and all the stuff you have, all that stuff that you've accumulated, it's all going to be left behind. Your spirit is going to separate from your body, and you're going to stand before Jesus. And imagine, as you stand before, you're going to kneel before Jesus. But guess what? You're going to want to kneel before Jesus, because now you're entering into your heavenly reward. And at some point, there is going to be this judgment seat of Christ. And He's going to Jesus is going to take, a, take some rewards. I don't know what he's going to take. Let's, let's just take this one, this, this prop. Jesus is going to place a crown upon your head. And I believe, uh, got to hold it together, guys. But I believe he's going to cup your face. I believe he's going to look at you, not just look at you, but he's going to look inside you. And he's going to see your spirit, the essence of who you are. And you are going to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Can, can you see the difference? Can, can you see the difference? And at that point, you're going to be escorted and ushered in into heaven uh, what's that going to look like? What's, what's that going to be like? Well, we're going to talk about that in two weeks. But you, when he says, well done, maybe he means, you know, when you serve those kids, kids university, youth university, when you, when you serve those kids, you made an eternal difference in their lives. You didn't even know what you were doing, but there are so many people that are here today, and generations are here today because of your service. Oh, you prayed. I saw you pray. I heard your prayers. Well done. You know, you were the brightest in your office. You, when everybody else laughed, you were faithful. When 
nobody saw what you did. Nobody saw the prayers that you prayed for your coworkers. I saw that. I know it wasn't easy. You did what was right. Well, well done. Guys, Jesus is going to say, I noticed. I noticed what you did. You, you, you didn't always have much, but you were always generous with what you had. I mean, you always put other people's needs before yours. You always tithe. You use what you had to meet the needs of other people. I noticed Jesus. Jesus is going to say, well done. Well, well done. You shared your faith. Oh, Jesus is going to say to some of you, you visited me while I was in prison and you comforted me while I was sick and you, and you gave me food when I was hungry and you gave me water when I was thirsty. And you know what you're going to do here? I think, I think, I don't know, but I think you're going to look kind of perplexed. I think you're going to be kind of disoriented and you're going to be like, Jesus, when did we do that? When did we do that? And Jesus is going to look at you and say, what you did to the least of these, you did to me. So what's heaven going to be like? Oh man, I can't wait for this one. Two weeks. I can't wait to talk to you about what heaven is going to be like. But I need you to know something today. There is no other option. Either you will go before God in this judgment, and your name will not be found in that book, or you will go before God in this judgment, and you will be rewarded or judged based upon what you did with what he gave you in this life. There is no other option. You cannot argue. You cannot debate. Some of you are skill manipulators. You cannot coerce, and you cannot talk your way out of it. Either you have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, or you do not. And if you do, then it's going to show in the life that you live here upon this earth, because what you believe about eternity will determine how you live today. Some of you, some of you might just, might just be saying, you know, Troy, I realize I'm a follower of Jesus, but my roots, and my roots have been getting deeper and deeper into this world. My roots have been getting deeper and deeper into the things around me and the things that are temporary in this, in this present darkness, in this world. And I want to break those roots. God, I want to be more eternally focused today than I've ever been in my life by the way that I live my life. And if that's you, right where you're at, I want you to bow. In fact, right where you're at, would you just in your living room, in your kitchen, in your garage, in your car, wherever you are, lift your hand up to God right now and say, God, that is me. My roots have been too deeply intertwined in this world and I want to live eternally focused from this point on in my life. Let me just pray for you. Father God, I pray that we would take this wake up call seriously. God, that we wouldn't just hear a message and go out and live the same way that we've always lived. That we wouldn't just be hearers of the word of God, but that we would be doers of the word of God. God, would you shake us? God, would you disrupt us in our life? Would you recalibrate us in our life? Take us back, God, to your truth in your word. I pray, God, for those that maybe realize that they've drifted way off center in their life. God, desperate times call for desperate measures. Help us, Lord. Change us, redirect us, refocus us. God, center us around your truth in your word, not just to make slight adjustments, God, but overhaul us entirely, we pray, putting you first in all we do. God, making sure we're at the center. You're at the center of our lives, and we're at the center in your word. Focus on truth, Lord. Help us to live for you. May our goal every single day, God, every day be not about this world, but by impacting that which matters to you for eternity. God, may our goal be to please you in all that we do and in all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, man, if you prayed that prayer and said, Lord, I just, I needed to get refocused. I, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to just put in the comments right now, amen. Just put amen in the comments right now. Don't even hesitate. Let that be your testimony. Yes, amen. Amen and amen. But now you listen to me. If you've been around me for a while, if you know me at all, man, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grandfather. If you've been around me very much, you know that my goal is never to use fear as a motivator. 
But the truth is, there is going to be a time when Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. And he says, it says in his word, we read it earlier, that many are going to say to me on that day, but didn't I do this? But didn't I do that? But I wasn't so bad. But didn't I do this? But didn't I? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You might say, but I went to new life. But, but I watched online. I listened to the podcast. I did good things. But Jesus may still say, I, I did not know you. So here's the biggest question. How can he know you? How can you know him? Probably the most important question that will ever be answered for you in your entire life. How can you know him? Let me be crystal clear with you today. We never are made right with God by our religious works or by our own efforts by what we do or by what we don't do. That never makes us right with God. The good news is that Jesus Christ did for us what we could never do for ourselves. In God's love for us, he became the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who was without sin and therefore was qualified to become this eternal sacrifice for us upon the cross some 2,000 years ago. He shed his blood on the cross. He died in your place and he died in my place. And three days later, he rose from the grave, victorious over it all. Why? So that anyone, that includes you, Romans 10, 13, so that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You'll be forgiven. You'll be transformed. It doesn't matter how dark your life is. It doesn't matter how much you've done wrong. When you confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, all your dirty deeds. That He gives you new life. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Listen to me. If you need his grace today, like the criminal hanging on the cross, I realize that I've done something wrong. I realize that I am a sinner. I realize that right now, if I was to die, my physical body dies, my spirit is going to go somewhere, I'm going to be judged. I realize, I don't know if my, book's, my name's in that book. I don't, I don't know. If you don't know that your name is in that book, then let me tell you your name is not in that book. Because when your name is in the book, you'll have the assurance of knowing that heaven is your home. You'll have the assurance of knowing the peace that passes understanding, the hope and glory, joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you need the grace of God, you need the mercy of God, you want to turn away from your sins and turn toward him, then you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. How do I do that, Troy? You don't do it by any works. You do it by surrender. It's, it's, it's about giving yourself completely to him. It's not about trying. It's about relying. How do I do that? You pray. You pray a prayer. That's what I want to do with you today. It's pray a prayer. And when you pray that prayer, immediately your name is written in the book. Immediately you're forgiven. You're like, well, what do I do? It feels like I need to do something more than that. I'm glad you feel that way. But we're not walking by your feelings. We're walking by the facts in God's word. And his word tells us that if you ask for forgiveness, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from it all. Your name goes in the book. If that's what you want, then that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna pray together. All my team in this auditorium is praying for you right now. We're gonna pray together. And if that's what you want, here's what you're gonna do. I want you right where you're at, not to lift one, but I want you to lift both hands. You're like, my wife is sitting next to me and I'm like, good for you, sir. Lift both hands. But my, but my dad is sitting here, and I, I'm a teenager, and I know I should, but I don't want to feel awkward. You lift your hands. You surrender to God. Just close your eyes and lift your hands to him and pray this prayer after me, and most importantly, mean it in your heart. Heavenly Father, come on, say it. Heavenly Father, 
I trust you and I give my life to you. Jesus, save me. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord. Be the Lord of my entire life. Fill me with your spirit, O God, so that I can live for you and follow you all the days of my life. My goal is to please you in all I do. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior forevermore in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, the Bible says that if Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me on earth, then I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. But listen, I don't want you to be ashamed. You should be more proud now than you've ever been in your life. I mean, you're, you, the joy of the Lord should be upon you right now. He has forgiven you. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out at all. And so what I want you to do now is I want you to put saved in the comments. Put saved in the comments right now on your computer. You let the world know that I am born again, that I'm set free. My name is written in the book, and now I'm looking for the judgment seat of Christ because one day one day Jesus is going to look at me and he's going to say I'm making everything I'm making everything new hallelujah hallelujah glory to the Lamb of God let's take one minute and worship God and then I'm going to come back and bless you before we go this morning hallelujah hallelujah if the mountains bow and reverence so will I the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out of silence, so will I. If the sun Shine. And we'll say again a hundred billion times. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm with family. We're part of the family of God. So we want to serve you any way we can. We want to resource you. We want to pray for you. All the things we said earlier, check us out on newlifeca.church. We have prayer meeting every night together just for five or six minutes. Join us at 8 p.m. Bible studies throughout the week, family studies, teen studies, opportunities for you to connect. We want to help you grow in your relationship with God. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. 
May he give you rest and may he give you peace. We love you, New Life Church. God bless you. Amen.